Brett's going to talk about AlphaFold. I think he put it in here um, inside of the Meetup link. So let me post that here in case some of you haven't stumped or didn't come through this channel. Um, and AlphaFold, he'll explain all that here in a bit. It's um, an algorithm uh, out of DeepMind um, using reinforcement learning. And there's some cool protein modeling going on. So fun uses of AI. Uh, he's been studying that for the last couple months. So also wanted to point out we're doing another meetup. Actually, I'm broadcasting out of New York uh, this week, and we'll be doing a meetup tonight uh, in connection with the O'Reilly AI conference that is out here all week. So we have a guest speaker this evening as well. Uh, we'll be posting the video, so keep an eye out for that. Um, I'll just post that one. It's the New York chapter of this meetup. Um, and we've got a guest speaker, Ansha Barth. Uh, she's a developer advocate for MapR, um, focusing on containers and Kubernetes and AI and machine learning, um, and also how it relates to distributed file systems, um, including you know Rook, uh, Ceph, um, and MapR also has their uh, proprietary file system as well. That's pretty slick. And the other big announcement here is that we've been moving more towards Kubeflow. So um, in case some of you are familiar, are not familiar, this is Kubeflow. Um, this is actually a specific part of Kubeflow. Let me back up. So Kubeflow actually has a, a lot of the same design principles as Pipeline. Uh, if you've been following the evolution of the Pipeline AI stack, um, you'll recognize a lot of similar patterns here. The cool thing is that Kubeflow has been uh, creating standards and different specs to uh, champion across experiments. So it, in some ways, competes with MLflow, uh, which is by the Databricks guys. Um, in, in some ways, it uh, supplements it. So all of these sort of experiment frameworks um, feed into pipeline, uh, which is really about you know, uh, like getting models into production. So super happy to see. And um, we have this running here. Uh, this is an internal link, by the way. So if you try to go here, this, this won't work for you. But um, yeah, here's an example. Uh, here's some of the pipelines here. They have examples and do XGBoost. So you know, really, like this is a graphical representation of the entire pipeline from creating the cluster to um, this is using TF uh, model analysis, some of the, the uh, TFX components out of TensorFlow, um, transforming. You can see all the inputs, all the outputs coming in, any uh, dependencies, you can parameterize it. So when you actually do go to run this, it'll ask you to fill in these parameters. These end up being hyperparameters, of course. Um, note that uh, so everything is Docker-based. So um, every step here has to be a Docker image. This is very reminiscent of uh, like Pachyderm, for example, uh, which is an open source sort of pipelining um, or like workflow tool framework um, is all Docker based and pipeline is all Docker based as well too. So uh, pretty slick stuff here and they have easy ways to create these Docker images out of Python code. Um, you set up like a base Docker image and then import all the libraries that you need and then it'll slurp in your Python file. And then you can connect them here and hopefully after a while, after a bunch of debugging, the outputs match the inputs and that kind of thing. So you can take a look at the source. I thought, actually when I first looked at this, I thought source was going to be the source code behind here. Um, I don't think you can actually get to the source code behind here here without going into GitHub or whatever. But um, this is the source for the, essentially, what ends up being the YAML. Yeah, so this is like an Argo project here. So Kubeflow is currently using Argo for this sort of GUI interface, which was a project out of Intuit, um, which is very timely since today is uh, tax day. So I'm sure there's quite a few of you using TurboTax right now. So you can thank those guys for creating this slick UI. Uh, which was picked up by Kubeflow. And then here's experiments. So here's the taxi one. I actually tried to run this earlier today, but um, realized there's all kinds of GitHub, or not GitHub, um, there's all sorts of Google Cloud dependencies. Uh, so this had no chance of actually being able to run. So I chose a simpler one. 
that just pulls down, um, let's see, what does this do? It pulls down some Shakespeare text file and then uh, let's see, what does it do? This is what it actually logged. So it's just, and then when it echoes, it's just echoing whatever it pulled down. So this is kind of slick. You could see the output of a training job. Um, I've seen examples of this running where you could actually see the TensorFlow loss uh, and steps and epics and things like that happening. So kind of cool. You could also see artifacts um, as well. So if this did train a model, it would end up here. Um, you could download the artifact, all that stuff. And then also um, in the experiments, if you do do uh, multiple runs here, I did two runs of these after cloning and you can compare the runs. Um, right now, it, it appears to be a little bit basic. It's not as full featured as ML flows um, experimentation. But the nice thing here is that when you use Kubeflow's version, it all ties into the Kubeflow subsystem. So, um, or the, the Kubeflow system. Let me um, show you guys real quick what this looks like in terms of Kubernetes. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite massive. This actually took us quite a bit to get installed. Um, and it almost completely took down my uh, MacBook last night when I was getting it installed here. So there's a whole bunch of pods running. You see some uh, familiar things here, Jupyter. So of course it supports Jupyter notebooks, um, which I'll show here in a sec. Um, it's using Minio, so that, that's kind of a layer on top of S3 and uh, Google Cloud Storage. Um, of course, MySQL's everywhere. Uh, this study job stuff is actually out of a project within Kubeflow called Katib. And study job um, studies are, uh, you know, different hyperparameter um, experiments and, and uh, different ways to um, uh, try out these different versions of these models. TF job, this has been around in, in Kubeflow since day one. This is um, an operator, which is a, a Kubernetes native construct that can accept a TensorFlow um, you know, Python file and actually run the job and distribute the job. Um, and it has a nice UI and everything here. Uh, Vizier works with the study job stuff. Um, and yes, yeah, so actually Vizier is the famous paper by Google. So it's kind of nice to see uh, th this Google project exposing not just papers, but also implementations. Um, Katib is the UI uh, for all this Vizier stuff. And what else? Yes, yeah, so anytime you run a training job, it'll actually spin it up here as a pod. And if it fails, um, you're kind of out of luck. You have to go kill it manually, as far as I can tell. And if it runs, it'll show you a status here, executed successfully. So let me back up and go to this screen here. So TF dashboard, which I actually have right here. If we were actually running a job, it would show it here. Here's the Katib stuff. This is all the, the study job, the different hyperparameter. The, the cool thing about this busier business is you can actually apply Bayesian um, rather optimizations. You could try, I think there's support for hyperbands. And these are all different algorithms for hyperparameter tuning uh, to sort of minimize the massive um, space that could, you know, uh, like could be explored by all these different combinations of hyperparameters. So uh, I think one of the, you put in your optimization type, either minimize, maximize, uh, and I think there's a way to specify, yeah, the suggested algorithm. So random, grid, Bayesian, hyperband, and, and if you have a custom one, boom, you can select that there. So let's grab hyperband. Um, and add suggestion parameters. So these are all concepts out of Vizier. Um, so, you know, take a look at that paper uh, and then create the study job. Then it'll actually uh, like distribute the hyperparameter optimization across this Kubernetes cluster. So I already showed you guys pipelines. Here's the exciting Jupyter notebook. Now this is actually slicker than I had realized. Um, let me see, how do I log out here? When you create the Jupyter notebook, it actually asks you which Docker image that you want to use. There's a bunch of parameters you could specify. Um, it's not doing it here because I already logged in, but let me see if I can log out here. 
go here, Jupiter Classic, log me out, so I can close. And then uh, anyway, so yeah, just know that you, there's a, a ton of options you could specify um, down to which uh, like Kubernetes uh, persistent volumes that you want to mount, um, which is very important for this type of thing. Uh, you, uh, you probably want to be using a, a distributed file system, uh, something like EFS from Amazon. Um, Pipeline uses Rook and Ceph so that we can run anywhere and we're not dependent on Amazon. Um, so check out the quick start here if you want to get Pipeline up and running and you'll be seeing more and more of this, um, this uh, Kubeflow stuff here as time goes on. So post that into here. And I have one other quick thing, seven thing, well, actually this isn't gonna be quick, so I'm, I'm just gonna run through it, but I've been working on this presentation um, for the meetup tonight that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, seven things you should know about TensorFlow and things like why am I running out of memory? There's some tips and tricks here. Also, I've got TensorFlow 2.0 tips in here. Use TensorBoard's new profiler. Um, let's see, why is my training job slow? There's you know, a bunch of tips and tricks here and ways to debug it. Uh, why are GPUs seem to be slower than CPUs? There's a bunch of things uh, that you have to configure when you're using GPUs. Unfortunately, it's, it's not out of the box in like a lot of cases, um, especially when you're running with Docker. There's some things that Docker doesn't do very well, like recognizing the number of CPUs um, that are truly on the machine. And sometimes you have problems getting GPUs. Why is TensorFlow serving predicting poorly? You know, some things uh, between training data and prediction data. Uh, and trying to reuse, you know, here's some pro tips here, not necessarily TensorFlow 2.0 tip, but uh, right, like reusing feature transformers across both training and predicting. Line uh, slide creation here. Why is TensorFlow serving so slow? I've got a little X over Flask, prefer the C++ native. Um, the second that you start using Flask and putting proxies in Python, in front of TensorFlow serving, you're gonna slow everything down. So push any custom feature transformations like CSV to um, Tensor or to NumPy array, push that into the actual graph so that TensorFlow can compile it and optimize it. You know, very similar to how you'd wanna push as much as possible into Spark so that Spark has a chance to optimize. Um, and uh, turn on batch predictions, that's kind of the obvious turbo button. Um, and use timeouts and fallbacks. This is something a lot of people who come from sort of a batch world into more online world, this is something that uh, they don't know about or aren't very familiar with, but you wanna be using very small, very aggressive timeouts that will snip um, any long running predictions that are getting uh, sort of out of tolerance and will then give the system time to auto scale up and, and not completely tip over uh, the cluster. Uh, number six here, it's about privacy. So the moral of this slide here is there's this new library called TF Privacy that you want to start using during training. And this introduces noise um, to such a level and you can tune the amount of noise and then you're able to subtract out that. So during training, you can introduce noise and then during prediction, you could subtract out the noise. Um, in a probabilistic sort of uh, non uh, or sort of anti-hacker way. The problem here, of course, is if you just post a model, um, people can start to run predictions and reverse engineer the model and they can actually determine how the model was created. They can start to uh, infer the weights that the model learned. And this is something that you, you don't wanna do, especially as you're putting more and more models online. Um, and then the last bit here is essentially TF Lite. There's a lot of TensorFlow Lite support that has gone into TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, so check this out. There's not only a custom runtime, um, but there's uh, which is called TF Lite Interpreter. 
Um, but there's also this TF Lite, uh, it's called Accuracy Library, that you can run against your uh, TF Lite converted models to see how well they're doing. Basically, you take your current model that's gigantic, that's been trained on your full data set and you know, 32-bit, you then quantize down um, into 16-bit, 8-bit, but you're also gonna lose some of the accuracy. So there's ways to actually re-quantize during training, and then there's ways to evaluate. So my slides always kind of have a tip here on how you can sort of monitor things yourself if you're trying to make these changes. Um, and I, I didn't even put a thank you slide here. Uh, so I will turn this over uh, to Brett. Yeah, Brett, let me stop my share and you can give us a blurb on, um, yeah, the alpha fold. Uh, like, feel free to ask questions in the chat over here. Yeah, I'll address sure. it. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, okay, one, yeah, do you, do you all hear me? Yeah? Yes, all good. Okay, okay. Um, here is the uh, Google link, I'll link that over here as well, just if anybody's um, missed it for the uh, uh, slides, but, uh, Ah, whatever. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, Google uh, announced AlphaFold um, right at the end of uh, last year. Um, they entered it into this online uh, this uh, protein prediction contest called CASP, and uh, they were they were able to significantly advance the state of the art in the field, and so. Uh, I started reading up on the whole thing, and it's a very interesting subject, and so I started reading more and more, and uh, I, I thought I'd put together this presentation just to sort of like uh, get all my thoughts out of my head, and sort of uh, this way maybe you can uh, uh, give you an entry point into this subject. Uh, there's a couple of interesting blog posts on this thing. There's one by this guy named Mohammed al Rashi. That's a very interesting uh, blog post. That's where I, I did a lot of my initial deep dive based off of that. Uh, I'll, I'll link that here at the end as well, but uh, you, you definitely should read that. Um, um, obligatory XKCD comic here. Um, so yeah, first let me start with a couple of uh, caveats. You know, uh, One, uh, my background is more on the computer computers and computer science end of things and a little bit of the neural networks so i'm not a uh, a biologist so uh take everything i say here with a very big grain of salt because um you know i, I i'm just abstracting things here um the second thing i'll add is that uh google has not announced a paper for this whole project per se so um, the only thing that they've actually done for the alpha fold thing so far is basically this two page abstract that they had to submit in order to get into the CAS uh, competition. And so basically everything I'm going to be talking about today is sort of uh, me doing educated guesses on top of that two page abstract. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm making good guesses here, but this is very much just uh, uh, you know, hypothesis, we'll, we'll phrase it that way. Um, the flip side of that though, is that uh, while I was in grad school, I took a uh, introductory course to protein modeling, sort of an overview of the field at the University of Missouri uh, uh, under Professor uh, Jack, Jack Chang there. And so um, he's uh, one of the people who makes uh, entries to this CASP thing every, every couple of years. So I think I have a, uh, a better background on the subject than a lot of, uh, than, than the average lay person will say. Um, so at a high level, uh, we'll just do like a quick review of protein modeling. Uh, we'll discuss the CASP uh, competition and then the alpha fold results. Uh, we'll look at a high-level overview of how the AlphaFold uh, prediction pipeline 
works. Uh, basically, it's a combination of a couple of different tricks. Uh, they use three different uh, neural networks. Um, it, the first level is sort of a, uh, this draw thing, which is a like a VAE that they're using to sort of uh, generate fragments based on the torsion backbone. Uh, from there, they combine the fragments together using uh, traditional simulated annealing. Uh, from there, then they can sort of start to score the proteins using a combination of two different uh, techniques. One's based around uh, co-evolutionary residues, and then the other one is just uh, sort of scoring networks, sort of a 3D-based approach. And then finally, um, they take this combined protein model and they apply some energy models and improvements based on that in order to get their final protein. Uh, so we'll sort of go through all these steps in this order, and then I'll, I'll sort of do a demo here at the end of uh, where you can go from here. Uh, so protein modeling. Um, DNA makes up all proteins. Uh, DNA sequencing has gotten very cheap over the last few decades. And so um, there's tons and tons of DNA that's been uh, sequenced. Various proteins have been sequenced. But on the flip side, we, we don't have a ton of great models of how things work. So in an ideal world, we could somehow take our DNA sequence out of our sequencing machine, put it into some sort of magical black box, we'll say, and then we would have a model of the actual uh, protein on the other end. Uh, the most practical, you know, the, the usual real world example of this stuff is just predicting drug interactions. Uh, you could say, you know, you imagine say that you have a perfect model of your protein, and then you could say, imagine, then, you know, a, a chemist can look at that and sort of say, ah, well then, yeah, I can fit in my, my drug here in order to say, you know, bind this particular receptor or something like that. Um, the other thing that's interesting is a lot of people are trying to like uh, build new proteins now. This is kind of a new and exciting area. But basically, um, you can generate a sequence of DNA and send it to a lab, a DNA sequence, and basically they can return you a test tube with that protein. And so if you could somehow um, you know, do this process computationally, then you can you know, save yourself the, the doing the real world round trip, we'll say, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of experimental processes for uh, doing protein modeling, um, but they're all basically extremely expensive. We're talking, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to do so. And so in an ideal world, we would just magically take our input DNA sequence, you know, add it to our computer, it would produce some sort of model, and then we could do science cheaply, and then, you know, we would um, make money off the whole thing. Uh, so first we'll do a very quick uh, overview of protein modeling. Uh, very broadly, there's two basic uh, schools of thought on how to do protein modeling. Uh, the first one we'll say is sort of the physics-based world. Um, we can model atoms and whatnot down very extremely well using modern physics. And so in theory, we can, you know, proteins are simply collections of atoms. So we should be able to model proteins as an extension of this. Um, this is a whole area. Um, of, of modeling, it's sort of like the, you know, we'll say just deriving things from first principles, that's the ab initio. Um, and then the flip side you have is what's called homology or uh, template modeling. But basically we take real world data and then sort of, you know, try to use real world data to make predictions. So we might take one protein and say that it looks like half like one protein and half like another protein. And so if we could just literally, you know, take the two models and chop them in half and sort of glue them together, we would actually have a reasonable prediction for what our, uh, our new protein would look like. Um, in practice, most things in the real world end up as some sort of combination of these two things. Um, you know, uh, ab initio works well on small scales, but once proteins get large, it starts to become extremely computationally uh, intractable, we'll say. Uh, homology, you know, um, if you have a protein that looks very similar to, you know, a candidate protein that looks very similar to something that's been found before, uh, you can do stuff with that. But oftentimes, the further and further away you get from uh, 
uh, traditional approach, you know, from, from existing stuff, the more and more you're just starting to guess. Um, so uh, the other reason I picked this slide here is it's sort of demonstrating end-to-end -end protein modeling, uh, which is a subject we'll come back to here at again at the end. Uh, so CASP is a competition uh, where they predict, where they, um, uh, to test people's ability to model proteins. It happens every two years. Uh, there's groups from all over the world that participate in this. Uh, the basic idea is that they uh, pick some proteins that haven't been modeled before, but haven't been sequenced. They give it to the groups. And then, uh, you know, a third party goes off and actually, uh, does the, uh, you know, the physical, physical work to, to build a physical model. And then they come back together and sort of try to see, you know, how close the predictions uh, match reality, we'll say. Uh, there's been sort of slow and steady progress in this field. It's been going on for a long time. Um, but uh, if you look at this graph over here, uh, this is from uh, Mohammed's uh, blog post, but um, we'll see that this blue dot way up here is the alpha fold thing. And so his conceptual model is sort of that um, alpha fold is sort of like roughly doubled what the normal progress in this field would be. And so just to sort of give you a picture of, uh, you know, you know, uh, what, what, what happened there. Um, an ideal world, we would be up here at 100% accuracy. So there's still a really long way to go. But, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's cool that uh, this amount of progress has been made in this short amount of time. So now we'll try to break down how they did it. Uh, the alpha fold is an end-to-end -end pipeline. So it starts off with a sequence and then it outputs at the very end a, a full-blown protein model. Uh, it's composed of these uh, different elements. Uh, they, the, the first one is a neural network. That's based around a uh, what's called the draw model. We'll look at that here in a second. But this generates uh, fragments. So a little bitty, like say with three and nine residue uh, pr protein sequences. Uh, from there, these little bitty fragments are combined together using simulated annealing, which is a traditional approach in this field. Uh, from there, AlphaFold uses two different uh, neural networks. One neural network is based around this concept of uh, inter-residue distances. Uh, we'll look at that one here in a second. And then the second one is a scoring network. It sort of attempts to uh, you know, quantify how much like a real protein the protein looks, so to speak. And then the combination of these two neural networks uh, is used as a score to produce sort of a candidate protein. Uh, from there, they add relaxation uh, which is a common approach in this field. We'll look at that real fast. And then finally, they have one more neural network to do a final uh, scoring of the protein and then output it for uh, um, the, the, uh, to, to produce the end results. Let me look at the questions real fast here. Okay. Okay. Uh, the draw model. Um, I thought this paper was really interesting. Uh, this is from the original paper. It's from a few years back. Uh, but basically, they combine an attention model with convolutional neural networks. Um, and so basically, the network sort of uh, can be trained to sort of generate realistic looking input coming from raw noise. Uh, basically, it's in a, uh, yeah, they use this attention model on top of a, uh, a variable autoencoder. And so uh, basically the, you know, they, they feed it input data and then the network can sort of refine uh, any new input into one of its, uh, one of the outputs that's seen before, so to speak. Um, so then what they did is they took this uh, approach, which was applied to 2D uh, images in this original paper. And then they, but they applied it in a completely different domain of, uh, the uh, 1D residues. Uh, so basically they can take the protein fragments from the real world and model them as a collection of uh, backbone and torsion angles. 
Uh, this is a well-known approach um, within the field, but basically then they can feed this VAE large amounts of real-world protein data, and it basically then can start to generate realistic-looking fragments based on whatever it needs, so to speak. Um, so then uh, this allows them to generate a lot of candidate fragments for whatever combination of input residues they need. Um, from there, they can take these fragments and combine them together using simulated annealing. Uh, this is a well understood traditional approach in this field, uh, but basically uh, we can uh, uh, take these fragments and then just try to minimize sort of an in energy, energy function across the collection of inputs. And from that, we sort of end up with a, a, a candidate full-blown protein string, we'll say. Um, this, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is what's usually called like protein folding, but uh, this is just a good way of getting from fragments to something that actually um, might start to look like a real world uh, protein fragment. Uh, uh, on top of this then, uh, the alpha fold uh, engine adds a couple of uh, interesting tricks. Uh, the first one is this use of coevolutionary statistics. Um, proteins loosely, uh, whenever they fold, uh, various regions often bind together or come into contact. And so if we look at this first one over here, this sort of, you know, A, this is like what a real world protein would sort of look like in model form. Uh, but then we can sort of uh, pull apart the uh, protein and produce this contact map. Loosely, this is just a large uh, diagonal. And then all these dark areas are regions that are uh, associated together. Um, and what's interesting about this is sort of, you can see there's these sort of patterns, right? There's these sort of areas that like to bind together. And these actually sort of really in the real world sort of correspond to, we'll say like low energy uh, uh, states for the protein or by extension, you know, uh, 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 places that whenever the protein attends, whenever the protein binds together, it, it's most likely to go. Uh, what's cool about this then, this contact map, is that it's an image, right? And we can start to model it using uh, convolutional uh, neural networks. Um, this is a bit of a side, but there was a really interesting paper I found in this field, where essentially they took contact maps for all these different proteins and then they applied a GAN to it. And then what was wild is basically the GAN could reproduce or, or sort of ge generate synthetic protein contact maps. And by extension, you know, something that you can sort of model to an actual protein just based on uh, whatever input it was given. Uh, so this is deep contact. Uh, this is a paper from uh, a couple of years ago, 2016 or so, I believe. It was one of the first ones to sort of uh, build up a convolutional neural network to work with these uh, uh, co-evolutionary, these contact maps. Um, so what we can see up here at the top is just how the actual uh, uh, convolutional neural network works. But they simply input this uh, contact map as a 1D map, uh, apply just very basic, uh, 1D CNN transforms to it, some pads, uh, they concatenate things together, uh, then do some 2D convolution tricks, and then finally they can output a prediction. Uh, I, I, I like this paper just because uh, I've done a lot of CNNs, and so um, this was very much, uh, I, I felt like it was, I could wrap my head around it. Uh, this is from a slightly newer paper, but uh, basically they've taken the approach from the, the paper I was showing before, and they've just cleaned it up and sort of formalized it and made it nicer. So this was a much prettier graph of how the pipeline works, but uh, loosely we you know take an input alphabet of sequences, run through some little bit of residual network, uh, generate this sort of thing, and then uh, output our our new sort of uh, predicted contact map.
Um, the second part of this piece, this, the, second, the second neural network then that's done is a scoring network. Um, for this, I think, th this is more me guessing, but I'm, I'm, it's my belief that they're using some sort of 3D convolution based off of real world data. So basically, uh, they can take lots of real world DNA sequences and run them through 3D transforms in order to uh, produce a sort of a score of how much the candidate protein looks like the uh, real world protein, we'll say, or, or like real world proteins that's seen before. Uh, so then I believe that they're simply using some version of this approach, and then they're running a lot of data samples through it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one here in a bit, but um, I think this sort of 3D CNN approach is probably uh, part, part of their, their tricks. Uh, so uh, by combining the contact max with the 3D scoring here, basically they're able to generate sort of a protein using simulated annealing uh, underneath it that uh, should be reasonably, uh, reasonably well built together. Um, the problem then is that um, oftentimes these protein models are overbound. Uh, so basically, as a result of doing the math, the math is often optimized uh, towards getting to a minimum energy state. But in the real world, uh, the, the protein models, uh, that's not usually the case. And so oftentimes the results of these uh, running these first few steps is that you end up with a protein model that's sort of all globbed together. Uh, so this is just a picture from a uh, Zhang Lab uh, paper from a couple few years ago. But the basic idea is to take the protein model and loosely to relax it, or just to sort of um, uh, add a little bit of energy to the system, let it bounce around a little bit. And so it gets to a state where it's not uh, overfitting to the problem, so to speak. I think that's probably the uh, best way to describe it. Um, and yeah, sometimes you'll see this referred to as refinement in the paper, but uh, these terms are basically uh, interchangeable. Uh, this is a well-known traditional thing, uh, but it's an important part of the protein uh, pipeline. And then, uh, yeah, so then finally they have one more network to do a final scoring of the thing and produce the output results. Um, for this, um, like I said, I don't really have a clear picture of what's going on conceptually. So I'm, I'm just sort of extrapolating here. Um, and so the uh, Mohammed al Karashi uh, blog post mentioned this other uh, energy network right here, this, this NEMO. So this is from a different group. But um, there, there's a high probability the alpha fold people are doing something similar to what NEMO is doing for doing the final energy prediction. Uh, but basically, they're using a combination of uh, uh, these other steps that have gone before and then some real world physics uh, to try and uh, you know, come up with some sort of number that's an approximate prediction for the value of the, the network. So this NEMO one is interesting to look at. Uh, We'll, we'll get into more into why here in a second, but um, loosely they're, they're trying to uh, build these protein uh, simulation models that basically go from the first step to the end step. So basically, instead of having like sort of, we do a step and then we feed it into a different pipeline, uh, we can just simply model things from end to end. And so then in theory, then the holy grail would be that uh, you can reduce all this computational complexity because you're, you're only building one gigantic model, so to speak. Um, I, I think probably, basically, I think this goal is a, a ways off yet, but basically I think the alpha fold uh, results are an important step towards, uh, uh, you know, sort of trying to unify this process. Okay. Um, so very broadly, uh, we've looked at, um, uh, how alpha folds put together. Uh, it starts off with some uh, fragments. Uh, then we combine the fragments using simulated annealing. Uh, we score the results based on both co-evolutionary statistics, which is like real world data, and then sort of 3D modeling, uh, which is, uh, sorry, co-evolutionary statistics, which is based off of uh, real world protein data, and then off of 
a 3D modeling function, which is based off of uh, real world uh, samples, we'll say. And then finally, we relax the model and uh, run it through another scoring network in order to get our final results. Uh, so whenever I do these presentations, I like to do a demo. Um, so what I thought I would demo here is just a 3D CNN. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with how 2D CNNs work and conceptually 3D CNNs are just literally adding another uh, dimension to the process. Uh, but um, historically they've been kind of extremely computationally expensive. And so people have sort of stayed away from them. You'll see them a little bit here and there in the medical world, but um, often the problem there is the medical world, they don't really have enough data in order to really like, uh, uh, use these things in the real world. Um, so, but anyway, what we're going to run through is just this little demo here. It's of a 3D, uh, it's a 3D CNN applied to the MNIST data set. So this guy took the MNIST data and sort of generated 3D voxels based off of the um, things. And then, oops, sorry. Um, and then, um, uh, loosely then I'm just running it here locally on my device. Um, and so if we go, uh, we'll let it run here in the background. It takes a couple of seconds. Um, but basically, uh, here's your traditional 2D in this data set and he generates sort of these 3D voxels. And then basically we take a, a two-dimensional CNN sort of approach and then uh, layer it in on top to uh, recognize the data. Um, this model does pretty well, we'll say. Uh, we're letting it run here for a second. Um, but sort of it's cheating because we're using synthetic data it's way, it's way cleaner data than anything you would probably encounter in the real world. And so um, we'll give it another 10 seconds here. Ugh, of course it failed for a print demo. Okay, we'll, we'll let this thing run here again in a second. I'll load it back up here in a second. Um, oops, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, this other slide over here on the far side is uh, VoxNet. Um, these 3D CNNs are used a lot in LiDAR applications right now. And so uh, this is kind of an interesting real world uh, area where this stuff is starting to be used. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the demo here in a second, but it should run this time. Um, so very broadly, uh, we've looked at how, uh, you know, we, we've taken a real quick look at protein modeling in general, we'll say, and how it, uh, it works. Uh, we've sort of done like a high level overview of the, how the alpha fold uh, builds a end-to-end -end protein modeling pipeline. Um, what, what I think is interesting about this approach is I don't think it's as revolutionary uh, perhaps as some people in the press made it out to be, but the flip side to me is I think, um, you know, they, they came in, they, they built on top of a lot of the existing stuff that had already been done before and then found some ways to significantly advance things. Um, what I thought was really interesting about the alpha fold approach is basically they're building an end-to-end -end pipeline. Um, a lot of the stuff in protein modeling has sort of um, historically been like you use one tool to generate one result and then you send it to another tool which generates another result, which send it to another tool which generates another result. And so you're sort of like doing this alchemy of combining things together. Um, th this creates a lot of problems. Uh, one of the big ones is simply that not all the tools play together. And so you're just sitting there literally troubleshooting weird stuff like you know, one tool uses, you know, you know, deals with pi and radians, another one deals with it in degrees, 
and you're sitting there literally dealing with floating point issues and stuff as a result of that. And so um, what's cool to me then about this alpha fold thing is sort of, you know, they take something in at one spot and it comes out at the other and every part in between is basically uh, completely um, uh, pr probabilistic or whatever, you know, De I'm sorry, deterministic. Uh, there's no magic involved. Um, and then I think that the, to me is the second interesting thing about this approach is that um, traditionally, whenever people approach these problems, you know, say you're modeling a particular protein, as a result, most of your data then becomes like related proteins in the field. And so I think this alpha fold approach is interesting because it's basically a, a full blown sort of a big data style approach, we'll say, in that basically they can take the entire, you know, PDDB. A PDB database and run it through the system. And, you know, so, and then in the, the more proteins it's seen, uh, the better the final end results will be. And so that's interesting to me because as this field gets more and more data, you know, as this data complexity and compute continues to expand in the next few years, uh, they're going to be able to uh, basically, you know, their, their model is going to improve as more and more things get sequenced and more and more uh, input stuff comes into the field. Um, and so then, yeah, broadly, uh, for my conclusion, I would just say that this is a, a very, uh, it's a small field, it has a bunch of weird, uh, you know, it, it's a small field and it has, uh, it needs more eyeballs, we'll say. Uh, what's cool to me then about this sort of stuff is things are starting to finally approach the point where like lay people can sort of come in and, and mess with the tools. So I think, I think finally that would be the, you know, if they can provoke more interest in this field and get more people playing with this stuff, I think that ultimately is what's going to uh, significantly move the needle down the road. Um, we'll, we'll see if my demo had any luck. We'll give it one more try. Yeah. Yeah, my demo got like 99% accuracy on that input data set. But like I said, it's kind of uh, dealing with a uh, synthetic uh, data. So it's kind of cheating we'll say. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, thanks for listening to me. Um, if you're interested more in this subject, I would highly recommend you read this blog post uh, by Mohammed. And then uh, this, uh, he has this YouTube video that he published uh, last month that you should check out. And then also there's this uh, YouTube video here uh, from uh, uh, last fall of explaining how the NEMO uh, system models proteins, which I thought was interesting as well. So uh, thank you for your time. Sweet, man. Yeah, that was good stuff. And is it safe to say that like most of DeepMind's models now come out in TensorFlow form? And so they're like reproducible and pretty well documented? Uh, I would say, yeah, they're, they're definitely doing things internally. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is they're, they're definitely extremely interested in uh, commercializing all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, historically they would publish a bunch of papers, but I think they're like um, going other to, uh, they're probably much more interested in seeing how they can make some money off this. But um, I, I would say they've done a lot of work on this, so um, they're, they're, they're entitled to it, so. Cool. And there's a couple comments and I think a question or two. Okay. Uh, thanks to Dina, who uh, seems to be pretty knowledgeable on this. Uh, Dina, Dina. Looks like she has a couple of yeah links. Uh, yeah. And then uh, eventually I'll put this up on the, well, well, we'll put this up on the internet and then I'll, uh, I'll link all the papers and stuff that I'm referenced here. Uh, do we have any other questions or? This question, can you list the synthetic protein contact references that you, that you preferred? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll list the papers once we get it online. How about okay. that? Okay, sounds yeah. good, man. All right, everyone, thanks for coming. We'll post this to youtube.pipeline.ai and we'll post the slides to slideshare.pipeline.ai here in, um, no later than tomorrow. Okay. Thanks so much, Brett. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, bye.